welcome everyone. So glad you're joining us here on this Memorial Day weekend, uh, specifically all of our online uh, viewers. So if you're coming uh, faithfully, coming here with us to church, or if you're visiting, whatever it may be, we're glad that you're watching with us here this weekend. And uh, man, our hearts go out to any of those that just have a special someone that we're remembering uh, specifically this weekend who uh, just their service. Um, and so our hearts are with those and we honor those who have uh, sacrificed for us. Um, I'm standing here today in front of our adopted graduate table. We have 27 high school graduates this year and uh, our church is just trying to bless each of them and send them cards of encouragement, gift cards, cash, verses, uh, words of advice. And uh, last year we sent about 250 cards to our graduates. This year my goal is 300. And so far you guys are crushing it. But if you have been here in person, you can email me at Caleb at FBC Salem or call the office. I would love to get you some names and addresses. So over the next two weeks, they just kind of get a barrage of cards and a bunch of love from our church that they uh, know that they're seen and they're loved by all of us. Um, But with that, We're excited to to worship with you, um, to sing, to worship, to take a moment and pause and uh, just connect with God wherever you're at and uh, listen to Pastor Mark's message uh, tonight that's going to be on sacrifice. So glad you're with us and uh, have a great weekend. great to see you. It's great to make a few new friends today, and it's so wonderful to be with everybody to worship God today. I'm so thankful for the opportunity to sing freely and to worship him. This first song that we're going to sing that says, we stand and lift up our, what does it say? We stand and lift up our hands. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. And it's great to have joy even when it's hard. So let's stand together. When we sing, you don't have to lift up your hands, but if we're going to sing it, you might as well just say, you know what, Lord, I'm going to be joyful and I'm going to sing to you because you're my strength. He's so many things and he is that as well. So let's sing this together.
that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise, let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it rise, let praise arise. We see you break down every wall. We watch the giants fall. You cannot survive. Inside of me, let it rise. Let faith arise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. You cannot survive. Sounds like we praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you.
I really appreciate, you can be seated, I really appreciate the last line in that song. For you are perfect no matter what, and in the joy or the suffering, I can still choose to worship because he's perfect, and his plan is perfect, and his timing is perfect. And to, to realize those things is so much of a bigger challenge, I think, that I know personally sometimes I anticipate. But falling back into the perfect timing and the perfect love and the perfect, well, he's perfect. What a great line that is. Let's continue to worship. His hands, his feet, my 
Father, I thank you for the way that reflecting on your gospel just through, through song, through singing, it, how it stirs our hearts. 
And as we spent this time just declaring those truths and singing our praise, I pray that our hearts would be drawn to you, to your cross, to the significance of what happened there. And that it gives us the courage to lay down our burdens, to come to you with open hands, that we can experience the joy, experience the life that you provided through that cross. And I thank you that we get to celebrate that through song, through worship, through being the body of Christ together. You are so good to us and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, that was a wonderful time of worship, wasn't it? I love this starting that song, just the, this, to cast our minds, just the, I was just struck by the, the visual picture, but also just the, the physical nature of that, casting our thoughts to the cross and how often I know that my thoughts can go so many directions, but when I cast those thoughts to where they need to be, how often it can begin to turn, turn my heart, to bring my mind to turn and bring me back to where I need to be. And often, sometimes we experience that on uh, at our, our church services, or sometimes it's a conversation, it's a prayer, it's worship in so many ways. But as we declare together those truths, that he's the king that we serve and worship, it kind of it unifies us, it establishes us as a people, doesn't it? It sets us apart and we can learn a lot by what people worship, by just observing and watching. And for us, we hope that our worship is something that stands out, that points to the cross, that points others to the Lord. And as a church, we're committed to that. And it's a wonderful thing that we declare and hold those truths and we get to do it with like-minded people, those that sing and, and sit next to us that we get to live life with. But our hope, our prayers, is that, that doesn't, it isn't uh, just contained to these walls, right? Matthew 5, 14 tells us, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your father who is in heaven. We're called to be a light, not just to this little block here at 395 Marion Street, but in our community. And one way that we've really been committed to this over the last several years is by offering our yearly summer, uh, our sports camp, our skills camp. Um, and it's been a great way where we've been to be able to take the joy of God's word into our community. It's both an outreach and a discipleship ministry of our church for our city. And we've seen it build bridges. We've seen it uh, establish new relationships. We've seen hearts transformed by the clear presentation of the gospel, all through sports, all through uh, robotics and art and those wonderful things. But the reality is, to, we highlight it, we take time right now even to talk about it because to make that happen, we need the commitment of our entire church body. And that can happen in a lot of ways, but we need you. You all have, each of you bring a set of skills and, and ways that God wants to plug you into the body. And this is one opportunity for us. So, I mean, if you're new at SFB, then uh, it's a great onboarding. It's a good way to make relationships, get connected with one of our, uh, just a main ministry that we do. Um, if you have a teen that needs some time away from a screen, you can send them our way. We'll use them, all right, all week long. Uh, if you uh, love food, me too, all right, um, come be blessed by hundreds of smiling faces as you give them a snack. All right. Um, if uh, you have more spare money than spare time, then make a donation. Help us continue to make this camp a possibility and outreach to our community. And together, well, I think we'll get to reap the benefits of being out in our city, both for our families here, the friends that are invited, and to see God work in some awesome ways. So there's two ways to get connected. Um, you can talk to um, Stephanie Thorpe, anyone on the team, or you can text FBC skills to 94000 and they can get information to where to get plugged in. We still have plenty of spots we need help getting filled and we can sh share more. But skills camp is just a wonderful way um, where we get to express our desire for our city uh, to be a, a city on a hill, to be that light that shines. And another way that we're committed to doing that is by lifting up and valuing God's word. So open up your, word, uh, your Bible if you have it. We're going to be in Philippians this morning, <laughs> this evening, um, Philippians 2, 19 through 30, and just read that with me. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, 
that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks for their own interests and not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I might have less anxiety. So then, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. Well, let me tell you a couple of things before we jump into the Word of God together today. Um, we, next week, are going to do something really, really fun and cool. Probably never done it here on a Sunday evening or Saturday evening, Sunday morning. But we're going to have a time centered around communion that is a celebration of God's faithfulness to us and his work through you over this last year. It's been kind of like an easy year. I don't know about you. It's like it's a yawner. I don't know, you know when we're going to have something tough to face. But in all of that, we're going to come together and just kind of purposely celebrate our unity in Christ and the work that Christ has done. And that's where you come in. We're going to have worship and we're going to have communion and we're going to have you. And you is, we're going to just take the microphone out and we're going to kind of ask you to wrestle with two questions or two statements. What has you, what have you been pleasantly surprised of that God has done in your life or you've seen God do in this last year? And then secondly, kind of in relationship to that story over there of again, building this altar, what has been your rock? And it might be a variety of things. And so what we want to do, and, and uh, we're going to let you kind of just encourage the body. Why would we do that? Well, Ephesians says, let each come bringing a psalm, bringing a word. And so we just want to put that into practice. We haven't really done that for a whole service. You're like, whoa, does that work? Yes. It's the most incredible time. We did it at a funeral today. And people just blessed and shared with each other. It was phenomenal. So you come next week. And uh, for those of you who are online, that have, uh, uh, you're yet to uh, be able to, just for health reasons, whatever the case may be, join us. You can email us in this week kind of your story and you can tell us and share with us kind of your rock or what has been pleasantly surprised. And we'll read it during the service because we're going to, as we always do, stream uh, Saturday night and that would be the time that you can do it. So, all right. This weekend is Memorial Day. It's Monday. The whole weekend, if you drive by any cemetery, you're going to see flags everywhere. They're out. I don't know why, but it's just beautiful to me. It's, uh, I was uh, driving uh, for a wedding this afternoon after the funeral. Kind of a crazy day. <laughs> Had to make sure I said the right thing at the right time. It wasn't dearly beloved and you take. And it was like that was at the wedding, not the funeral. But uh, when I was driving out there, I went by way out in the country, off the beaten path, this little cemetery. I have no idea who owns it and who's buried there, but it's just beautiful today. It's these, these glorious flags. What's a Memorial Day or Memorial Weekend about other than a score of people other than yourselves went away for the weekend and are in their travel trailer? When I was a kid, we went to the cemetery a little bit, not a lot. It wasn't a practice of our family, necessarily, uh, with our kids. But it is a time that our country said there are certain things that we have to value. And one of them was personal sacrifice. We decided as a country that it's important to not forget those who gave the greatest gift that they could give. I don't know how many times you've woke up in the morning. Uh, it's not that I don't like other languages. I just appreciate the fact that I speak English. 
Uh, you know, sometimes I wish I would spoke five or six languages. I just happen to really be thankful that you and I get to worship together, that we're not experiencing what they're experiencing in Yemen, that we didn't wake up today living in North Korea or ran by China. There's a score of countries. I have nothing against them at all. I'm just very thankful that there was a group of people who were willing to say, I believe in this country enough to fight for the freedom of those who will live here after me. They didn't know your name. They didn't know mine. They didn't know your kids. They didn't have a flashcard in front of them. Oh, I'm going to die for them. They died for a concept, an idea, a principle of freedom. That's what this weekend is about. And we as a country decided that we wanted to remind ourselves, and I hope we never forget it, the freedom always comes at a cost. It did with your personal freedom with Jesus Christ, and it did with your national freedom with people who died for you. And when you wake up tomorrow, it's not a perfect government that we live under, not run by perfect people. Some days you just want to wring their neck. And other days, you thank God you're not there because somebody would want to wring your neck. But the reality is, it's really a good place. And people died for you and I to live with this freedom. This is a weekend where we honor the mourning of military who have died in the performance of their duties. Why do we do that? I think one of the things that our founding fathers and those who came along after them discovered that there are principles in the scripture that seem to kind of rise to the top like cream. And one of them is the honoring of personal sacrifice. There's an upside to sacrifice. There's a benefit to it. We tend to look at all of the problems of sacrifice, but there's a huge benefit to it. When Paul was trying to raise this value, he said to them in chapter 2 of the book of Philippians, have this attitude in you, which is also in Christ, that though he was in heaven and had all of the fellowship of heaven and peace of heaven, he did not grasp and hold on to it, but released it, took on the form of a servant, human, and became a servant even unto death on the cross. And Paul says to you, and he says to me, there's an upside to sacrifice. Just like with Christ's life. And he says, I want you to have exactly the same attitude. To drive it home a little further, I want to take us to this passage that we're in today. Because Paul is going to move out of the concept of have this attitude in you to this. I've got two people that I want to raise up that demonstrate to us there's an upside to sacrifice. They happen to be two young men. Both of which Paul had mentored, both of which he had trained, both of which he had launched into ministry. One was by the name of Timothy and the other was the name of Epaphroditus. They were men who teach us what it looks like, that there's an upside to sacrifice. They are both men who live with this conviction. And it's the conviction that all of our lives are sent ones. We don't live our lives on our own. We don't think our lives belong to us. We all are individuals under the authority of God, sent by God to a specific location. Paul says, I hope in the Lord Jesus. Why did he put that in there? In other words, this is not my idea. This is not my stuff. I hope in the Lord in other words, if it aligns with the Lord, then I'm in. If it's not in alignment with the Lord, I have no authority to send you. But I hope in the Lord to send Timothy to you soon that I may be cheered when I receive news about you. Well, it's not that Timothy was bored. Let's be, remind ourselves. Timothy had a job, right? He was a pastor of a wonderfully growing and impactful church there in Ephesus. So why would Paul do this? 
Maybe it's because he didn't have anyone else. Maybe it's because, as he said in this text, I don't have anyone like Timothy. So he's raising up this beautiful example. My friends, there's an upside to sacrifice. And at the core of the person who's willing to be the sacrifice is the willingness to be sent. It's the willingness to take an assignment. It's the willingness to see my life as a gift because that's what it is. You see, being sent is not a duty. It's not a drudgery. It's a gift. I mean, let's be honest. If you're traveling along and it's 12 o'clock at night and you're driving along and it's raining like crazy and you see flashing lights up there ahead of you and you pull in behind them and somebody has a flat tire and they can't figure out how to change their tire and you change their tire, nobody says, oh boy, thank you for your duty. Oh, no, thank you so much for the gift of your, what, expertise. Thank you so much, you see. So Paul's trying to help them see. To be sent by God is not this horrible duty. It's a privilege. It's an honor. How do we know that? For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of of God is eternal life through what? Jesus Christ. You see, if Christ is a gift, then you are too. It's not that you're going to die and save people. No, Jesus did that. But the reality is in John chapter 20, verse 21, it says that as the Father sent me, so am I sending you. And when the Father sent the Son, he sent him as a gift. A free gift. And when the Father takes your life and he says, I want to send you. I want to put you on assignment. I want to place you in somewhere that you're going to do something great. You are sent not as a duty obligated to do what God has asked you to do. Oh, that's there. But you're really sent to what? To be a gift. To be a blessing. You will always live your life as one sent to be a gift, but you're going to have to be gritty. It's kind of a synonym for sacrifice. You have to be. Why? Well, look at what it describes of Epaphroditus. He longs for all of you and he is distressed because he heard, you, you heard that he was Ill, in, Ill. Indeed, he was ill, Paul says. <laughs> Absolutely. And he almost died. For what reason? Read on, he says, but God had mercy on him and not on him only, but on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am in the more eager to send him so that when you see him, you may be glad. Welcome him. Honor him. Honor men like him. Why? Because he almost died for the work of Christ. The fact is, if Christ is going to send you into this world to be a sacrifice, to be a person who brings blessing, don't think for a moment that that life is going to be always easy. Don't think for a second that, wow, if I am sent by God and blessed by God, then I am going to live this unbelievably cared for, protected life. Oh, not at all. He almost died. Paul, you know the litany of his things. But it begins with this characteristic and this conviction. You will live all of your life as one sent. We candidly used to use that as missionaries. Missionaries were sent. Not lay people, we used to call ourselves. Missionaries are sent. Teachers that, that teach at Black Forest Academy, they're sent. But me, I teach at Gubser, I'm not sent. Oh, yes, you are. If you want to understand the upside of sacrifice, you'll understand the principle we are all sent. We're sent to be a gift. You're sent to be a gift to your neighborhood. You don't live there by accident. The place that you live, the neighbors you have, God wants to give them a gift and he's going to give it to you through you. 
You're not sent there primarily to convince them to vote the way you politically vote. You're sent there to be a gift, to be a blessing, to take the gospel. And if you do, and you want to be this kind of blessing, then you will choose to take a vested interest in the well-being of other people. You will understand that I'm sent here primarily for the benefit of other people. Not because I like the street, not because I like the house, not because the deck is glorious, not because I can see Mount Hood, not because of any of that. That's all gravy. What's the primary purpose of God sending you to be on mission, to be there on purpose? Paul tells us. Everyone looks out for his own interests, but not the interests of Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself. He takes a genuine interest in your welfare. I want you to ask yourself a question. Just be honest. Do you look that way at your neighbors? Do you look that way at your family? Do you look that way at it that way when you go to work tomorrow or tonight? Do you look at it as I am here for the general interest? I am here to take on the interest and the well-being of those people that God has put me in influence of. We do that when we understand that there's an upside to sacrifice. He took a general interest, which means he's going to set aside his own personal agenda. This is really hard. We've been trained all of our life that we have rights. We've been trained all of our life that we need to look out for ourselves. And then we come in to grip and, and encounter the word of God. And it is so counterintuitive, so countercultural to everything you and I have been trained The reality is, what does Paul say about him? I have no one like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. Everyone looks out for his own interest, but not Timothy. Not Timothy. What does it look like to put the interest of people ahead of your own? It means that you will be a person who's willing to alter your schedule. It means you are going to be a person who's willing to alter your budget. It means that you're going to be a person who's willing to sacrifice something in your personal life for the benefit of another person. It means that you will, be, you will allow others to inconvenience you. It means that you won't say, I'm available only here, but you're going to do your best. It's not impossible all the time. But if you really live for the interest of other people, then you will do your best to shape your life to meet their needs. That's what Timothy did. I am willing to what? Leave my church here. Leave Ephesus Allow somebody else a period of time to pastor the church while I go and do what? Meet the needs of my friend Paul. Meet the needs of this congregation here in Philippi. It's just like today. It's hard for you to take vacation to go meet the needs of a friend. You have limited vacation. It's not easy to give that up. Not easy to take, you know, money you've saved for a project at your house and meet the needs of another person that has a dire, dire need that it's like just far more severe than yours. That's not easy. (laughs) You kidding me? That's like, no, I don't want to do that. But that's what it takes when you understand the upside of sacrifice. You're willing to set aside your own personal agenda and you're willing to take up the agenda of Christ. I have no one who will take a genuine interest in your welfare for everyone looks for his own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. What are the interests of Christ? 
I can give it to you in a phrase. How about if you finish it with me? Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which is. Yeah. That's his interest. When you boil it all down. Jesus Christ came to this earth for one absolutely narrow focus. I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. And the person who understands the upside of sacrifice is willing to align their heart to a large degree to that focus. I am sent in this place. I live in the city of Salem to seek and to save that which is lost. Not to keep friends, not to make family members happy. Of course I want to do that. But at the end of the day, Paul says of Timothy, I have very few like you. Most people are looking out for their own interests. It's not bad. It's not bad to plan for retirement. It's not bad to, bad to plan for your next renovation. It's not bad at all. It's not bad to take a vacation. You need to take those vacations. It, it, he's not against that. He's just simply asking a question. Why are you here? Did God send you? Do you look at your neighborhood as your assignment field, your mission field that God has said, I'm sending you there? I never forget. <laughs> it's a great story. Howard Hendricks, this lady came to Howard Hendricks. I cannot believe it. I moved into a neighborhood and I prayed that God would give me great neighbors. I pray that God would give me just unbelievably godly Christian neighbors and we'd be able to have Christian f families for my kids. And I moved into my neighborhood and she was complaining to Howie. And she said to Dr. Hendricks, Dr. Hendricks, I cannot believe that God wouldn't answer my prayer. I moved into a neighborhood and there's not one Christian on our cul-de-sac. I, why wouldn't God answer my prayer? And Howie Hendricks said this. It was the best thing. I cannot believe God would entrust that many non-Christians to your care. <laughs> See the difference? We all want this easy life. We want a bunch of Christians around us. We want to be filled with Christians around our block. That's not a bad thing. Other than, my friends, that's not why the church got left here. I mean, if Jesus was only concerned in you fellowshipping the day you got saved, boom, you would have been beamed to heaven. God would have taken you to heaven. It's like you got saved, Whoop, come fellowship with us. No, he saved you that you might be what? A sent one. But it's going to take sacrifice. It's going to mean that you're going to take up the agenda of Christ. And it means that you will demonstrate a surrendered heart. There's an upside to sacrifice. And it comes when we discover that we have a teachable heart. I want to send to you Timothy. He's like a son to me. He served with me in the work of the gospel. Why would Paul make that statement? He's like a son to me. He's been a partner who taught Timothy how to preach the gospel? Didn't go to seminary. Who taught him? Paul. Who taught Timothy how to surrender and sacrifice anything for the sake of the gospel? It was Paul. Do you know what his number one lesson was? Timothy, go get circumcised. Do what? I want you to get circumcised. Uh-uh. I'm a grown man. I know. Get circumcised. Why? We're free in Christ. Are you kidding me? Why would I do that? Because we might go into some areas where there's Jews and I don't want them to make an issue out of your body. I want them to make an issue only of the cross of Jesus Christ. And you know what Timothy did? He did it. I don't know what that looks like for you and me. I don't know what the dynamic equivalent is. But I can tell you one thing. Getting circumcised at the age of 20 it's not a small amount of obedience. 
I probably would have argued for a whole lot more of his work through Galatia and Titus that he didn't make him get you know, circumcised. I had to probably you know, come up with all kinds of reasons why I shouldn't have to wear a mask. I would come up with all kinds of reasons why I needed to be free. Paul says, no. Timothy, I want to teach you about the life of humility. I want to teach you about the life of putting other people ahead of your own personal interests. Why? Because there's an upside to sacrifice. And to do that, not only do you have to be teachable, but I think you have to have a, a proven loyalty. You can see it in Timothy. I think it just comes out so clear in Epaphroditus' life. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard that he was ill. Ha! Stop for a minute. Do you know people who call you just to let you know that they're ill? I'm sick. I'm home in bed. You know what that's code word for? Please bring me dinner. I mean, my stars, we want everyone to know. We put it on Facebook. We tell everyone on Facebook that we are going into surgery. We had surgery. We're convalescing at home. And dear Lord, please send an army to care for me. He was distressed that they found out he was ill. Why? Because he didn't want to be heavy on their heart. How much love can a man have for a congregation that he says, I do not want you to know that I'm ill. Not because I want to live a hidden life or I want to live this closed life. No, he genuinely didn't want his congregation, those in the Philippi, to be distressed at the fact that he almost died. Wow. What a loyal yoke fellow. Timothy labored with me in the gospel. He labored with me when I stayed awake at night and was preaching the gospel. And I preached so long, Paul says, a guy fell out of the window. Yep, Timothy hung in there with me. When I had to work and I had to sew tents and I had to do some extra tents just to make a living. You know who put the tent away with me at night? Timothy. There's an upside to sacrifice. But it's going to take a teachable heart and a, and a loyalty. And it's going to take a developed or a tested spirit. And it's going to show in a history of sacrifice. It's going to show in a person. Welcome him in the Lord. Honor men like him. Why? Why? Because he has a track record of sacrifice. Timothy has a track record of sacrifice. He has a history of it. He was willing to risk his life so that he could get to Paul, his friend, and care for him. He was willing to risk everything he had just to get to Paul and to feed him so that Paul could be cared for. You see, this letter was written in prison. They didn't have prisons like we do. I'm not against our prisons. I wish they weren't so full. But I'm glad we feed prisoners. They didn't. If Paul ate, it was because friends brought him food. If Paul got any hygiene, any care at all, it was because friends came and took care of him. And for Timothy to get there, it's a long way and it's a travel trip and it's, it's gonna, you're going to risk your life. And the fact is there's an upside to sacrifice, but it's a real sacrifice and it's a history of sacrifice. And when he sacrificed, there were battle scars. Timothy had them. If you read through some of the letters that Paul was writing to Timothy, you can see between the lines that Timothy was frequently thinking about quitting. Paul would try and urge him and encourage him and help him see the upside. But Timothy, you know, he would dream up things like, Paul, I think I'm too young. 
<laughs> man, these guys don't respect me. It's like, I'm a young guy and man, they kind of take shots at me and they say things like, well, you know, young man, I've been around the block a few times and when you have, you'll see things my way. And Timothy's like, you know, man, Paul, maybe I should wait until I'm a little older until I'm a pastor. Why would he say that? Because he's been beat up. Because he's taking it in chops. You will develop a tested spirit if you sacrifice. Why? Because A.W. Tozer said it well. God never uses a person greatly until he has wounded them deeply. There's an upside to sacrifice. What is it? Well, the fact that you're a Christian is one of the greatest upsides to sacrifice. He did not hold on to heaven freely gave it up, took on the form of a servant and humbled himself even to the point of death on a cross. Honor Epaphroditus, honor Timothy. Why? Because they gave up their life for you. They gave up their life to push forward the work of the gospel. And there will be people in heaven because they were willing to risk everything and take up the agenda of Christ. Augustine of Hippo said this about sacrifice. The greater one's love is, the easier the work. Sometimes people will tell me, Pastor, I've had enough. I can't take living in this place anymore. I can't take living with this person anymore. I can't take working in this place anymore. I want to move. I want to quit. I want to leave her. I want a different job. I want to encourage you maybe to consider a different question. Did God send you there? Did God call you to this region like he called me? Did God call you where you live? Because if you believe that, there's an upside to sacrifice. There's an upside to leaning into the battle. Have this attitude in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. What was the upside of Christ's sacrifice? Your life, your freedom. What's the upside of Paul's sacrifice? Timothy and Epaphroditus. What's the upside of Timothy and Epaphroditus? The Philippine church. The, the Philippian church. What's the upside of Timothy's sacrifice? One of the greatest and most influential early churches, the Ephesus church. What's the upside of sacrifice? There will be people in heaven celebrating because you were willing to be sent. Pastor, I can't take this anymore. Yes, you can. You can if you're sent. I can't take this spouse anymore. Yes, you can. You can if you're sent. If God has made a covenant with you in your heart, I can't, I can't go to work anymore. Yes, you can. Not because it's easy. There's just an upside to sacrifice. And Augustine said it so well. The greater one's love, the easier the work. Might you pray with me? God, don't let me off the hook. Give me a greater love so that I see the upside of sacrifice. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. We recognize that it's not an easy life that you've called us to, but why should we ever expect that? It wasn't an easy life that you lived. In fact, you promised us that we would be rejected. 
You promised us that we would be experiencing stuff like we're experiencing today. And sadly, Lord, I'm sometimes shocked and surprised at how surprised I am. And even at times how disgusted I am. Please forgive me for the times that I've betrayed Paul's words that I will fill up the sufferings of Christ. That I think somehow that I'm above them or that I shouldn't experience them. Ah, forgive me for that. And help me see the privilege of being a sent one, the gift of loving. The Father, this place that is really hard and oftentimes godless is where we were sent by God to seek and to save that which is lost. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Before we leave, I want to invite uh, those who are going to be joining us in official membership. Um, come on up front. I'm going to meet you down here, and we're just going to introduce you. Um, what You say, well, I've never seen this. What is this? Well, um, membership has its privileges in our church. What are they? The privilege to serve. <laughs> The privilege to partner, come on out. And uh, in each of our services, we had, I think, 42 different people. And they will be spread out over all of our services. Come on over. And they're going to be joining us. And so we're just going to, in each of the services, introduce to you friends who say, you know, this is where God has sent us. This is where God has called us. And we're going to have them introduce their names and then... Uh, if uh, you're healthy, you can come up and say hi, all right? If you're not healthy, what are you here for? <laughs> I love you. All right, Mike, would you introduce your family? And we'll welcome you. Hi, I'm uh, Mike Ewai. This is my son, Akai. My name is Akai Ewai, and this is my mom, Kathy Lee Ewai. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> nice work, sir. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> Welcome to the team. Thank you. I think you got a future. <laughs> you do. Oh, man, we're just thrilled. Whenever I see new people come to the church, I think, God, what gifts have you given them that you're going to fill in for us? And how do we need them? Because that's why God brings them. So I want you to come up for those of you uh, who feel the freedom to come up and just say hi and welcome them. Welcome to our church. Thank We're you. thrilled that God called you here. Thank you. And thanks for serving on security tonight. Absolutely. That's really pretty cool. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Lord Jesus, we bless you and thank you. And uh, may your grace shine upon us in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening and weekend.